How's it going guys, Inks the Cynic here, and welcome to the first part of my Minimator 1.0.0 Demo 5 tutorial possible series thing. I know there are a lot of Minimator tutorials out there, but if you're like me, maybe you're a little bit slow, or uh, maybe some of those other tutorials don't really seem as comprehensive, and you know, they just don't work with the way you like to think. And uh, that's kind of the issue I often find when I look for tutorials. So I thought I would try my hand at creating one to help others like me, or at least a couple of people I know who are trying to get into Minimator. So let's get started. First thing you need is Minimator, of course. We have it on screen here. But first, let's go on over to this. This is the Minimator forums, and this is the link. I'll have the link in the description, possibly on an annotation on the screen here. And this is where you need to go. And what you're going to find here are these two links. One is the installer or the zip. It's up to you which one you decide to go for, but uh, I think when I download it, I just got the installer. Anyway, it's not that simple. First, before you install Minimator, go ahead and click on this link here, which will take you to this page here, and you need this in order to install and run Minimator. It's not that, it seems a little scary, but it's not that daunting. Just do that, make sure you run it without, you know, doing anything to screw it up. Don't don't be scared though, it's really simple. So do that, download it, and then when you install it, it'll install pretty much like any other program. And then, let's go ahead and get rid of this. When you open up Minimator, this is the screen you'll get. Super simple, very elegant, nice, and clean so far. It's going to get a little more complicated, not too bad though. So let's go ahead and click New Project. And we're going to name this one M.I. Toot for Manimator Tutorial. And you can enter this stuff in if you want to. I don't really feel like there's much of a need. So then you're into the program. All right, so now what? Now what do you do? You got a big landscape here. You can click and go around. Left click does this where it's kind of an orbiting camera. It goes around if you have a subject. Otherwise, it'll be whatever the center point for the camera is. And if you right click, this is more of a pan as if you were playing Minecraft or any other game and looking around from your character's perspective. So that's the first element of the interface and how you will interact with the program. Now, before I get started, one thing I want to do is bring up a couple of expectations. If you're not familiar with Minimator, then you may be kind of expecting to make something that looks kind of like a Blender animation or a Cinema 4D animation. Uh, it's not going to look th that good. Like, Minimator is more of a interpretation of the actual game, like how Minecraft actually looks. It has features like some shader type things that uh, make it look a little better, but generally you're you're going to make something that looks pretty much like the game, but maybe a little more polished and a little more art artsy, you might say. Second is uh, if you're just getting started with animation, now this is not coming from a professional. I am not uh, very good at it myself, but just to note, don't expect to be the next element animation or slam a cow or insert name of famed Minecraft animator here guy like on your first attempt like you're gonna have to expect things to be a little rough in the beginning but as you go you'll get better and one of the beautiful things about Minimator is that it makes it fun to learn if you ever tried to learn Blender or something you may be well aware as I am that it's very difficult, very time consuming, and very confusing, and then also makes it very difficult to get a good quality result at the end because the rendering is so intensive, whereas with Minimator things can uh, go pretty quickly. All right, so enough of that. So if you come here to your project tab, this is basically what you set up in the beginning, but now you have a couple more features. This is the folder telling you where your project is. This is the size, meaning when you render it out, this is gonna be the size of your screen your uh, your animation screen resolution. And uh, by default, it's at 1280 by 720, which is pretty good. If you want to bump up to full HD, you have that option here. You can also do 2K and 4K. Now, if you want to render a video in that, like an animation, you might have some more difficulty. But if you have a beefy rig and the right editing software, maybe you can. Tempo, um, I honestly don't really mess with this that much. Uh, I think this could be used if you want to create like fast motion or slow motion. Uh, in older versions of Minimator, I think it was used more to uh, interpret how many frames you were getting and things like that, but I'm not really sure it has that much of a use in that regard anymore. So that's the project tab library. This is where all of your elements are going to be stored. To get started here, we'll go ahead and do that. We'll click on that. And that brings up the uh, workbench over here. Now, if I click off of it, what you'll notice is you have this crafting table. And this is, of course, Minimator being closer to Minecraft. This is mimicking 
the uh, you know the crafting table in Minecraft. Also, you have these options. We'll get to those in a second. If you click on this, then you have these options. You have a character. Notice up here it says workbench, and then it'll change. Character, you have scenery, you have item, block, special block, camera, and all these other options. You can go over them. These on the bottom here are not Minecraft things. These are ways that you can bring in... Uh, you know, outside elements and create things that aren't even within the game. So Minimator has a little more flexibility beyond Minecraft, which is pretty cool. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and bring in a character. So that way we know what we're looking at. And as you can see, he's floating in the sky here. And now over here in the library tab, we have character. So now that we have our character in the scene, you can see that there are a few more options now. One is, of course, you can delete his butt if you don't want him there anymore. And then uh, two is you have yeah, you can do this this thing. Sorry, I'm stumbling with myself. You can create a new one altogether, or you can do this, which if you notice on the bottom left here, you have human. This is uh, your guy. This is your timeline. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but you can click on this one, and it introduces a whole another one of that character. Now, if you make a change, like let's see, let's let's click on his arm here. And let's make his arm come up. All right. So we we have a do with an arm, and as you can see, there. are or two, let's go ahead and move him over so we can see a little better. All right, so there's the duplicate, and this is our original that we're working with here. If we go back to this, okay, if we, I'll get to that in a second as well, all this stuff coming up, sorry. Um, if we go back to this, it creates another one, and see how he, his arm, he, his arm, is not moved. It is just another template of that base character that we brought in. Sorry about that, I got ahead of myself. If you notice here what we have, we've created three of these guys on the timeline. And you notice over here it says use three on uh, our character here. So that means we've spawned in one character and we've made copies of him onto the timeline. So we have this one character item in our library, but we uh, have three of him dispersed onto our timeline. I think this can be used to kind of keep your library clear while adding new uh, characters into your scene and into your timeline. But if you click duplicate the given template, then what you'll get is a second character in the uh, the library here that you can then bring into the timeline. As you can see, it says use count zero. And what you can do from here is use this button to create a new instance of it in the timeline. So now you have uh, another human number two based on that duplicate that you've made. This has a few uh, uses to it, but we won't go into that right now. All right, so we have to delete these three guys from our uh, timeline here. We don't want them there anymore, but you notice when we click on it, we uh, get these extra tabs. Now, these are going to be brought up maybe in a future part, but for now, the important one is this one here. So if you notice, we have the human selected, and then if we go over here and click on these, it brings up the properties for each individual guy in the timeline. And on this one, you have delete, and you can also duplicate from here and, uh, you know, make multiple characters that have the same movements if you're doing a larger scene. Anyway, for now, we're just going to go ahead and delete them, get rid of those guys, and now we're back to our one single guy holding his arm out and stuff. So that's basically the library tab. You can also change the model from here. Uh, this is all pretty simple. You can just play around with it and figure that stuff out on your own, but that's what it is. And then you can also change your skin here. Uh, you can browse on your computer if you have one or use the default one here. And uh, I've never used the download feature, so I can't comment on that. Apologize. Then you have background. And this has a ton of features that have to do with, as you can imagine, the background. You can change the uh, biome type, and you notice it changes a little bit of the colors of the grass there. For now, we're just going to leave that alone. We'll go into all this at a later date. And then finally, you have resources. Now, this is where any element that you bring in, if you import a piece of scenery from a Minecraft world you have or a skin or anything, all that is stored here. Uh, I don't really know if there's much of an issue with leaving a lot of that here. I generally try to keep mine cleaned up, so I'll use the use count, and if I see any with zero on it, once I've completed the scene, I'll go ahead and delete them and get them out of the way, just so I don't have anything cluttering up my interface. Now, finally, what you have here is the settings tab. So you click on this, and then you get this other window coming out here, and you have program, and what this does is Backup projects automatically, you can set the time between the intervals that it does backups and how many like separate backups it'll do. This is useful because I've had times where I've created a complicated scene and the program would freeze up and crash. I've even had it crash my computer 
and your save may be way behind if you haven't continued to save as you've been working. Having this setup will allow you to load up one of those backup saves and hopefully retrieve some of the work that you may have lost from your uh, manual saves. So that's a good thing to turn on. You can even reduce that amount of time if you want to make sure that it, you don't lose too much if something happens. So next thing you have is like copy projects in the project directory. I never use this. Uh, you know, you can check it out for yourself, play with it, see if you want to do any of that. But the another important thing here is spawn objects near the camera. This is pretty convenient because if you're in an area of your scene and you want to spawn something in there, with this check, it'll spawn it in near where you're looking instead of, uh, I guess, at the base zero point of the workspace here where you'd have to go and fish them out. Uh, and then copy work camera into new cameras means when you spawn a camera in, it's going to put it wherever you're looking once again to make it convenient from where your perspective is in the workspace. You have interface. This is uh, all customizable things that you can do to make Minimator look better. I've never personally used it, but there are people who've made it look pretty cool. I, I intend to do it someday, but you can also, I think, download ones that people have made and uh, import them. And uh, yeah, so there's that. Then controls. This tells you all of your shortcuts and your keys and what everything does. You can go over this and kind of get familiar with it. You can adjust the speed that you move throughout the scene. Also, your look sensitivity. All of those great things. Sorry about that. I ran into a little bit of an issue, but we're going to get on into it. If you go down here to the graphics tab, you have your default bending set to sharp or round. Like I'm not 100% sure if it comes by default set to sharp or round, but mine is at least set to round at this point. You can choose however you want it when you start a new project, which one is going to be set to. And uh, what you have here is your bending detail. Now, what happens here... If we click on our Iron Golem's arm, you notice that when we bend here, it looks like that, right? So it's pretty square, pretty weird looking. His arm kind of extends out. But if we go to his graphic settings, now you see it says left arm properties because we have the left arm selected. You have all these other things that you can get into as well. But right now we're going to be in the graphics tab. Like that may not be dropped down, but if it, if it isn't, then click on it and drop it down. And then you click round bending and notice how his, his arm has changed does this and what you can do is alter this this number here and it tells you how many uh, points there are throughout that bend depending on how smooth you want it to look I personally go for about five because it gives you that round look without it being too round for Minecraft more or less that's at least my uh, idea of it but anyway the f next thing you have is remove edges from scenes I haven't really uh, worked with that too much. I think if you have a larger scene, maybe it um, does some stuff to help that, but I've never really needed to use it. Finally, you have the render tab. And now this one is the one that you, there are some things to it that you may want to do while you're working, but a lot of this you'll want to change only when you're ready to render. So to show what this does, we're going to go ahead and spawn in a camera. We're going to go to our workbench. We're going to pick camera, double click on it. And as you can see, it did spawn exactly where we're looking. And now we have this down here. And if you right click in this, you can actually move the camera the way it's pointed uh, without having to use some of the manual parameters. So that's always a good thing to notice and utilize. So let's go ahead and do this. Sometimes the, uh, the rotation will be a little off. Like let's say if I'm looking over here, when I go to rotate, it kind of like has me over a weird center. So one way to quickly fix that is to center it on your screen. Like go ahead and look at it with right click. And then when you rotate, it'll rotate around that. Like it automatically selects it. But if you're not looking at it, it can kind of throw off the uh, the axis or whatever. So down here we have our guy. Oops. Hang on. Let's bring this up. Oh, come on, man. All right. <laughs> Let's bring this up so we can see a little better. There is, a, you could make this the view, I think, but for now we're going to use the double view because this is probably how you're going to be working when you're making your animations. So what we're going to do is go down here and you have this button. What this button is is the render tab or render button, and it shows you the lighting as it's going to appear in your final render. You may not see much difference here. See, you just see a little shadow. Let's bring our guy down so we can actually uh, look at him right against the ground. Let's close this for one second and let's make all of his parameters, his position parameters set to default. And what that's going to do is put him at the dead center of our work scene 
or of our scene and have him perfectly in line with this ground texture that we have. And we'll go ahead and move our camera. And when we hit that, you'll now notice he has a shadow. All right. So for one second here, we're going to get all get into all of this at a later time. But for now, what we're going to do is do this just so we can see what's going on and understand how things are working out for us. Can't find the sun. Let's bring it over. Notice how its shadow is now changing. Let's see. I guess it's okay right there. All right. So you may notice that his shadow is a little bit wonky. It's not really giving us what we want to see. So let's go back and open up our render tab or our render settings. What is this? Settings. Okay. It's just settings. And if we go to, all right, first of all, I'm going to turn this off just in case. You have shadow quality, you have shadow size, and then you have depth of field blur size. Now, depth of field is a uh, parameter with the camera. We're not going to worry about that right now. It's turned off by default, but you can turn it on when you need it or if you need it, if you want it in your scene. So right now we only have sunlight. You can add spotlights and point lights, and you also have camera detail. We're going to turn camera detail to insane. Now, this is scary. Hopefully it doesn't crash me, but let's do it. So we do that. And then we're going to turn sunlight detail to insane. This is a very simple scene, so I don't expect to have much trouble here, but we'll, we'll see what happens. All right. So now we've got that. So if we turn this on, boom, look at that. He has a, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, he has a perfectly beautiful shadow now, and it looks great. And as you can see in the top frame here, the, uh, the work camera, you might say, he has no shadow. You can turn this on here, but generally I like to have one like this, like with the rendering on and one without it so I can work in scenes where you're going to have a lot of darkness and things like that. You may not want to have to work in that actual darkness uh, and try to see what you're doing when you can't actually see what you're doing. So that's a point to remember. Anyway, so as you can see, I have this up at insane. The higher it is, then the better it is. And you don't want to really mess with that while you're editing. You want to keep those things pretty low while you're uh, working on something because it can uh, really screw up the efficiency that your computer is running the program and make it very difficult to animate. So that's the basics of the Minimator interface. Up here you have like your save. We're going to go ahead and save our project and you have these render buttons and all this stuff that we'll get to in a later date. But that is the beginning. That's how you get started. That's the interface. From there you can play around with it yourself and I'll come back for the next one and hopefully show you guys how to set up a scene and pose your characters and things like that. All right. So thanks for joining me, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was, hope it was helpful. And uh, if it was, feel free to hit that like button. Comment. Let me know what you think. Subscribe to Become the Citizen today. And I'll see you guys in the next video.